Good morning to all our viewers. We are happy that you decided to join us for another episode of Pastor's Corner. We have long been anticipating this week and we assure you that we will have a grand time in God's presence. We want to invite you to like and to share the page. Let your friends and families know that we are on with the Greater Conference of Seventh-day Adventists episode of um, Pastor's Corner. So we just want to welcome you in a very special way. And at this time, we will approach the throne of God as we ask God's presence and His Holy Spirit to lead, lead, guide, and direct everything that will be done and said here. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. We give you thanks and praise. We thank you, God, for your love. We thank you for your mercy. And we pray that God, as we spend this time in your presence discussing such an interesting and dynamic topic, that, oh God, your name would be glorified. May you be with us. May you guide us, may you protect us, and we pray to God at the end that some man, some woman, some boy, some girl will be touched by your word, touched by the discussion, and they will give their lives to you. Be with those who are present here, be with the panelists there, God, be with myself, and we pray to God that we'll allow your spirit to do his thing through us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're really happy that you decided to join us, as I told you earlier on. We would like for you to like and share the page with your friends and your family members so they too can be a part of what is happening here this morning. All right, this morning we have a very, very interesting topic. The, the topic is very, very interesting. We want to encourage you to, to, um, to tune in and do not go anywhere because as we discuss such an interesting topic, we know that God's presence will, will be with you and as a result of that, lives can be changed. It's, we live in a world today that is very dynamic and Everywhere, things seem to be changing. As a result of that, we have to make different adjustments in order to deal with the challenges of this world. And as a result of that, sometimes um, we do not really know our place. But today, as we discuss that, that topic that I'm about to, um, to mention to you, I want you to understand that we will know our rightful place according to God's principles. All right, so our topic today is entitled, the LGBTQI movement and the church. My partner, male or female, does it matter? The LGBTQI movement and the church. My partner, male or female, does it matter? And this morning we have some panelists with us. And the, pan the panelists, they will introduce themselves. I got two a competent young man here, and I will say young men because every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And as you spend time with God, the mosses of God are new every morning. So those men, they are young men of God. All right? So at this point, to my extreme right, he will introduce himself. Good morning, friends. My name is Jerome Gordon, and I am the co-host of the program Donna Gordon Family Show and host of the program Family Matters on GFN Radio 91.3 FM. All right, and to my immediate right, this young man will introduce himself and he'll tell you a little about himself as well. Uh, pleasant good morning to you. I'm Charles Gittens. Uh, I have been a pastor for quite a number of years. I, right now, I am pastoring in the uh, East Central District. 
and definitely I'm enjoying pastoring. All right, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, young men. And um, at this point, we will turn over to our promotional video as we continue the program for this morning. I am Oliver Scott, a pastor of the Southern Adventist Church. I'm an ordained minister, and I'm working with the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Presently, I serve as the executive secretary of the conference, also the communication director and prayer ministries director. I am married to my dear wife, Sheena, and have one child, a daughter by the name of Summer. One of the things that I like in pastoral ministry or enjoy has to do with meeting, interacting, and mingling with the membership of the church. It brings me a lot of joy um, to interact with God's people. And that's one of the advantages that I find in pastoral ministry. For me, in terms of my personal philosophy in life, is to be in the will of God in every detail of my life. Not that I'm flawless, but I strive to be in God's will in every single detail of my life. My ultimate desire and aim is that when Jesus returns, he will usher me into his eternal kingdom. All right, and we thank you for looking at this promotional video. And we will continue our programming for this morning. We have a lot in store for you. So we want to remind you to like, to share the page with a friend, a family member, as we discuss what we have in store for you. So immediately we get into it because remember, it's a very interesting topic. My partner, male or female, does it matter? The LGBTQI movement and the church. All right, so our first question this morning is entitled, the question is, um, what is the modern terminology that refers to the homosexual community and its corresponding facets? I, I want to repeat that question. What is the modern terminology that refers to the homosexuality community and its corresponding facet? I, I want to direct that question over to Pastor Gordon. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, the modern terminology, well, it's more um, accurately called um, an initialism because it resembles an acronym, but not quite an acronym. It's an initialism, and the initialism used to be um, LGBT, referring to l lesbians, gays, bisexuals. But as time progressed, the persons involved in the promotion and defense of um, gay rights felt that there were some other groups that were excluded. And so the initialism was extended to include more. So it was extended to LGBTQI. And still, there were those, it's the moderator, who felt that they were left out. And so the initialism was extended further. And to my knowledge, there is still an ongoing um, extension to the initialism to the point where some people wonder if they're going to use the whole alphabet. Well, currently, you have the L, for stands for lesbian, G for gays, B for bisexuals, T for transgender, Q for questioning, for those persons who are not quite sure where on the spectrum they fall. And so they are questioning. And, um, and then there is another Q that has been recently added, which is for queer, which means that people who are not within the formally accepted circle and they are they have issues that are different from that which is traditional and of course the I is um, intersex so we have um, an initialism that is ever expanding to the moderator okay and I, I think this is this is well in place but um, I, I, another question I want to ask uh, as a result of this um, this evolution this this um, initialism or that is happening with the different sexes and the different orientation and different feelings and, and all those different things. You know. Is there a, an evolution taking place in this movement in reference to public support and sympathy? And I want to direct the question to, to Pastor Gittens. Is there a, an evolution a taking place in, in this movement in, refer, in reference to the public support and sympathy for those people? Uh, well, 
straight to the point, I would say yes. Uh, what is actually happening is that a lot of individuals are viewing the LGBTQIA movement as persons who they think they are marginalized. And what is happening is a lot of sympathy is going in that direction in terms of uh, trying to make those persons very comfortable. So definitely there is a change towards uh, more acceptance of that group of individuals. All right, so um, do you know of any example, any experience um, recently in the media or so where some way an individual who um, probably refused to do something for persons who are aligned to um, the LGBTQI uh, movement and they were um, probably prosecuted, they were um, carried to court or something like that? Do you know of any example? You are Pastor Gordon? Well, there have been over the years a number of examples. We have had uh, the outstanding one that went to the Supreme Court of the, um, the cake bakers. Uh, we've had photographers who were taken to task because they refused to capture, uh, and videographers too, who were taken to task because they refused to participate in um, activities organized by the LGBT movement. So it's an ongoing thing. I've seen pastors who were, um, they were told that the attorneys of the LGBT um, movement had a prosecutorial interest in their refusal to carry out the gay wedding. So the, the case is multiplying, but the famous one that went to the Supreme Court that had everybody talking was the one with the cake bakers. And of course, we know how that one was resolved. So the cases do multiply right now. If you go on the internet, you'll find there's several ones, not just the recent cake one, but several where people are now saying, if you don't offer me the service because of my sexual orientation, you have violated my rights. You're discriminating against me. And as a result, we have gotten a lot of legislative support and there are now policy changes and, and enactments from the various parliaments and legislative bodies that give support to us. So people are now being taken to court and they have a prosecutorial interest in your refusal to offer their service. Okay, so basically what is, what is being said is that um, persons who do not align themselves to, the, to those individuals or the, or the movement and do not support them, they are, they are put under pressure in, t in terms of giving those who are aligned to that movement sympathy and giving them support. All right, so let's move on. Um, in an effort, I want to I direct that question or directly I to lead to us as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In an effort to be inclusive, and I want you to, to capitalize on the adjective that I'm using. In an effort to be inclusive, loving, and understanding, would it be appropriate for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to accept a homosexual life homosexual life as part of the church's culture. I want to repeat the, the adjectives. Inclusive, loving, and understanding. Uh, well, in response to what you're asking, first of all, I would say that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a welcoming of individuals of all types of lifestyle. However, uh, it must be pointed out that even though we will welcome, let's say, a prostitute who comes to the church or a criminal, welcome in the sense that the church doors are open and we allow them to come in uh, to listen to what is going on. Uh, yet at the same time, however, uh, it must be clearly pointed out that we do not condone or just say, go ahead, uh, do what you're doing uh, in terms of this homosexual lifestyle, and it is all right. No, it's not like that. Uh, you're allowed to come in because the church doors are open, and, and we should uh, treat these individuals with respect, but we are not at the same time saying uh, you can uh, adhere, stick with that homosexual, practicing homosexual lifestyle, and you are going to be a member. No, it's not like that. Uh, so loving, yes, inclusive in the sense uh, we, we do not close the door to you, 
uh, but at this uh, and yet at the same time we pointing out that that lifestyle uh, is not in keeping with our biblical mandate uh, so even though you are allowed to to be in and we will uh, smile with you uh, we will however uh, be willing to guide you towards what is the correct lifestyle all right before pastor garden goes i just want to um, take some comments from the screen um there was somebody who was saying um from the from the comments um tirona lashington is saying we have been groomed to be sympathetic through social media and movies etc so that's why we have to be very careful what you look at all right um i saw um sister shares was asking that we define some of the term but um they were they were defined earlier so pastor um Gordon, can you just reiterate those points for us? Those, those letters, sure. what they mean? Um, LGBTQI, um, L for lesbian, G for gays, B, bisexual, T, transgender, Q, and there are actually two Qs now, QQ. Um, the first Q is for questioning, which means that the person is questioning. The person has not been definitive gender-wise and is still questioning or exploring. And the other Q, queer, means that the person does not fit in the normal um, range of what is defined. The person is somewhat, uh, may I say, aberrant, for want of a better term. So the person is considered queer from the perspective of what is considered the normal pool of identified sexual orientation. And uh, I, for intersex, um, referring to which normally, traditionally, we have um, known intersex to, to mean hermaphrodite or hermaphroditism, but now it's been called intersex. So that's LGBTQQI. Now, we could keep going, but <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. All right. Thank you very much. Right. So we just wanted to um, um, move on to another question. Another question that says, because we just spoke about being inclusive, loving, and understanding. So the question I want to ask, how can the church demonstrate our non-discriminatory attitude towards the LGBTQI community while at the same time maintaining our moral standard? How can we draw that line? Because um, sometimes people have the tendency to think, okay, well... Um, you are you are gay. You are you are part of this movement, and you can't come to our church. You we, we don't want no part of you, and so on. But how can we show um, that we do not discriminate ag against those individuals while at the same time maintaining the principles of the Seventh Day Adventist Church and of the Bible? Well, you know, I I am fascinated by the 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 many tiers of leadership in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and they and the, the incredible organization that the church has. And to enter the church, of course, we, it's through consensus. There's a baptismal vow. And in the baptismal vow, the last one, number 13, says that the Seventh-day Adventist church constitutes the remnant church of Bible prophecy. And people of all race and languages are invited and accepted into its fellowship. To me, that very succinctly and beautifully captures our exclusivity, our inclusivity and our non-discriminatory stance as far as people and people groups are concerned. We welcome anybody from anywhere. But while we are inclusive, we have a standard, a biblical standard to maintain. So we invite you to come, but when you come, we help you to live up to the biblical standard. And I think this was beautifully articulated by Pastor Gittins earlier. So non-discrimination, yes, we are a non-discriminating people. Everybody, whoever you are, Get um, lesbians, queer, questioning, intersex, uh, um, Muslims, Hindus. It doesn't matter what is your orientation, your philosophical persuasion. You are invited into the Seventh Adventist Church. However, we do have a biblical standard that we will help you, nurture you to live up to. All right. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to take some comments from on the screen. Um, Manasseh Wilson is saying, when one accepts Christ, they are no longer a homosexual. They are, they are renewed in Christ. Um, and Sister Shea is saying, thank you for the explanation of the words. Um, Sister Alicia Lawrence is saying, God loves the sinner, hates the sin. We have to do the same. And we have another comment there, and then uh, um, we'll ask another question, and then we'll take a, a break. Manasseh says, Al along with the way we accept all, but ex expect them to give up their sinful practices. The same applies to the persons with sexual orientation, right? So when you, you accept Christ, 
as you are, but you do not stay the way you are, right? So we, we reach out to you, as Christ did, in order that you, you can be saved and your life can be changed, but we do not expect you to remain the same way you are. So the next question that immediately comes to mind is that, should the church relate the same to members who have an innate attraction to the same sex or, and those who are acting on those inclinations? So how should the church, should the church relate to the same person who just attracted to the person and another person who is acting on that attraction? Um, I would say there is a difference. Uh, let, me, let me go back. There is a difference in terms of the individuals who are attracted to the same sex. Full stop. An attraction, uh, a male being attracted to a male or a female being attracted to a female uh, in itself is not a sin issue. Uh, of course, it can lead down the path of sin. So if an individual uh, is attracted to uh, the same sex, uh, my attitude as a church member, forget about me being a pastor now, my attitude as a church member should be caring to that person and be willing to listen to that individual and not push them away and categorize them as if they are, they are a practicing homosexual. Uh, because you see, when I listen to the person, I am allowing them to ventilate and see how they feel. And by listening to that individual, I can assist in terms of pointing out to them uh, biblically uh, how they should uh, how they should behave. Uh, so so that's, that's, that's how I take that one. The person who is practicing, uh, it's, it's a different category. It's a different category of, of individual. All right. And I have a next question to ask, but I will ask that question. I will ask the question and then we'll take the response after, after we take that break. If a young man or a young woman reveals to you that they have a desire for the same sex, what would be your appropriate response? We will now take a break and then when we come back, we will deal with that question. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But then things change when you're down in. You may 
and he'll make them right. And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. The God of All right, we want to thank Sister Isado for that wonderful um, special music. We know that we can always trust God because God can always come through for his people. It doesn't matter what we are facing, how difficult the situation is, we know that God will always come through for us because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. The question that I asked before um, we went for that wonderful special music is that if a young man or a young woman revealed that he or she is attracted to the opposite sex or has a desire for them, what would be your appropriate response? Well, that's a pretty good question, Mr. Moderator. And this is one that as pastors we would run into from time to time. Um, I don't think that a person who has an attraction for the opposite, I mean for same sex, a same sex attraction in certain circles, it's called homo heroticism or you have a homo heroic thought you are not practicing anything but you do have this i think we must first be very clear this is a problem um, sexuality has been biblically defined and so anything that is counter to the or contrary to the biblical um, definition the biblical prescription of how sexuality is to be received, embraced, and activated is a problem. Now, off camera, Pastor Gittins and I were talking. A person who has the inclination but is not practicing still has a problem and still needs to be delivered, but you would be more compassionate. Well, you should always be compassionate in your approach, but the person must not walk away thinking that I'm only at the level of attraction, therefore I am fine, everything is hunky-dory and peachy, I don't have a problem. But we must always be compassionate in leading the person into a real and candid and biblical recognition of the issue. And then in a nice, non-judgmental, non-condemnatory fashion, lead the person to deliverance. All right, Pastor Gittens. Um, in, in terms of listening to Pastor Garden Ventilate, uh, I am very much aware that the church has a light and the church is to guide. Uh, the church is also uh, to assist individuals in change. It means, therefore, that the individual we're discussing who is attracted to the same sex, we have to be extremely careful as members how we treat that individual. Don't be horridly judgmental, uh, but be compassionate with the person and don't scorn that individual because we have the light to share with this person. Uh, so when I befriend this individual who is attracted to the same sex, and at the same time, I befriend them, not befriend full stop, but befriend with the intention of leading them into a proper relationship with God, uh, that is good. But if, as they open their mouth and say, I am attracted to the same sex, uh, we push them away, uh, then how would we be able to assist that individual to change? So it's important that we're very compassionate in terms of dealing with that person. And, and just to add, in being compassionate, there is no way in which we are derogating from the biblical position. The Bible unequivocally excoriates um, sodomy. Uh, but as people, we understand we're dealing with human beings who have been socially programmed under various circumstances, and people need our love and our yes. compassion. So I agree with Pastor Gittins. The approach you take should always be seasoned with love while you maintain your biblical position. All right, so let's uh, take some, some comments from the viewers. So just go back up to the top so we can. All right, okay. All right, 
Don't go back too far. All right. Okay. Sometimes, um, um, Alicia Lawrence is saying, sometimes we treat sin differently, especially when it comes to sexual sins. Change for some behaviors take a while and it's not instantaneous. All right. Margaret Mapp says, check the Bible. What does it say about same sex union? We come into that. Um, Craig says, homosexuality is having a sexual attraction. So then, can a child be gay or be a homosexual? Well, we will come to that. We have some different terms. And remember, we're not only talking about homosexual. Eh? We're not only talking about homosexual. We're talking about the LGBTQI. And we give you those different terms. So it's not only about a male and a female or a male and a male or a female and a female. There are some who are, um, they are undecided. They do not know where they stand. Right? Um, um, Tirona saying, um, but doesn't sin start in the heart, mind? Wouldn't it be attracted? Would it, wouldn't it be attracted to the same sex fall in this category as a man think it so easy? Wow, that's a powerful point. Let us take the approach of Christ. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Aline says attraction is the op attraction to the opposite sex falls under the category of lust. So it is definitely a sin if you go by the Bible standard. There is no difference to me from actually acting on the attraction. They are both sinful practices. Let us not whitewash the biblical words of God. Uh, let's go on a little more. Um, just to point on that, the cities God destroyed, there was more than one sin being practiced. All right, so we're moving on. Um, okay. All right, um, Sister Alicia. Are, are we going to respond to some of those, Mr. Moderator? Uh, hold on. <laughs> we, 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 we'll do that after. <laughs> a person who accepts registry. Jesus as a practicing homosexual have serious struggles that take time and counsel. Why do we treat this sin differently? How many of us still struggling with sin? Oh. All right, so we can, I, take I some, think, we can give no, some response. I, you know, I think I should get, give a little response to that one because I've, I've often heard people say, all sin is sin. And it depends on what they mean because that could be true or, that it, could be, or it could be false. All sin is not sin. But where do you get that from, Pastor Gordon? In the Bible. In fact, the Bible categorizes sin um, differently. While it is a fact that all sin will get you to hell, but in terms of consequences, not all sin is the same. But when it comes on to sexual sins, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, identifies sexual sins um, have been, uh, are in a category, rather, uh, by themselves. So what Paul is saying that every other sin is out the body, but sexual sins are against the body. And so in that, he shows that, hey, you've got to identify sexual sins for what they are. They are not regular sins. So people ask, what's up with this thing about homosexuality? Why are you guys zeroing on it? It's not our doing. It's coming out of Paul in theology. First Corinthians chapter 6 says so. All right, thank you very much. All right, Pastor Gittes, do you want to respond to any of the comments that the viewers have, um, have written? Um, in terms of, in terms of, I, I'm looking at um, Cyrus is saying, why do we put sexual uh, sin on such a high pedestal? Um, what I would say is that, and here I'm not dealing with homosexuality. I'm just dealing with sexual sin. Uh, if an individual, if I steal from Pastor Garden, uh, if I steal his phone, uh, all I have to do is return his phone and tell him sorry. However, if I'm involved in a sexual sin with an individual, just saying I'm sorry uh, doesn't cut it. It's deeper than that. Uh, further, uh, this may be something that I appreciate. This may be something that I end up being addicted to. So it is more difficult uh, to deal with and to get rid of a sexual sin than to just return something that is stolen, right? Uh, that's, that's my quick response to uh, Cyrus about sex, um, on a, putting sin on a pedestal. Okay, okay. all right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Right, and that response is, is well in place. And it's very interesting to know that... Um, Sometimes when it comes to the scene of homosexuality and so on, um, I, I want us to understand that, that that sin is sin, right? And um, sometimes we treat um, 
homosexuality and so on in a different manner. Right? So, but we have to know that um, Christ can help every individual who have a sin challenge. For example, there was a time I was doing a crusade in one of the, one of the countries, I don't want to uh, mention where. And there was an individual who came to me and he was moving in a kind of way. So you, you know, the way he moved, you know that probably he was leaning on the other side. And when, he, when, I, when I finished the crusade, I was doing baptism and he came to me and he said, Pastor, you know, um, I want to speak to you. And, you know, in this kind of nice kind of accent and so. And I said, okay, well, um, you can speak to me after the baptism. And we spoke. And he told me that he had the tendency and he was practicing. Hmm. And I, I listened to him. Normal, normal. Hmm. And um, after I, I, I spoke with him, so I said, what's your desire? He said, Pastor, I want to break free. I, I need deliverance. I want God to change my life. I want to be baptized. And I, I organized a deliverance service with him. I, I met him at the church. We prayed. We asked God for his, um, his power um, to, to deliver him from his weakness. And eventually he was baptized. Right. And he gave his heart to Jesus. And um, I, I wanted to understand that, as Sister Alicia mentioned earlier, some things do not change instantaneously. There are some people who are in church years now and they are still struggling. Um, but sometimes we have, we have zero tolerance to people who are, who are on the other side. Right? But we have to understand that what God has done for us and for others, he can also do it for them. That's All right? It. So we're moving on now. According to the Bible, what are the notable sins of Sodom that caused their destruction? According to the Bible, what are the notable sins of Sodom that caused their destruction? Well, well straight, to the, straight to the point, uh, Genesis chapter 19 points out very clearly uh, that two angels visited. Uh, and, well, to, to run straight to it, uh, they wanted to have, the men wanted to have carnal knowledge uh, with the two visitors. So straight to the point, it was uh, homosexuality, male with male, straight to the point. That was the main sin in Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, thank Genesis you very much. Genesis chapter 19, very important. Yeah, Genesis so chapter use, 19. Use the, uh, yeah. Okay, so we'll just read some of the comments and then we'll have a promotional um, video. So let's go down, let's, let's scroll along as we read some of the comments. All right, it says all right there. Or oh, somebody is just happy to see Pastor Gordon. <laughs> Please, uh, the purse is on a dangerous highway. <laughs> 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 Keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> Good to see you too. All right. Okay, even John is saying, so if someone is born a homophobic, is it right to change your gender to the one you feel a desire for? And let me tell you, viewers, that the, the program that we have today, we can't finish it today. So there is a part two to it uh, next week at the same time, 11.30. And some of the questions that you're asking, that we have that question that I'm done pack. And if by chance you have any other question, you can just send it directly to the, to the Mission Live and then the, we, we can consider it for next week's um, program. Okay? So at this point, we will have our promotion of it. This morning, Pope Francis shaking up the Catholic Church, supporting same-sex civil unions in the new documentary, Francesco. The Pope says what we have to create is a civil union law. That way they are legally covered. I stood up for that. Words welcomed by Father Jim Martin, an advocate for LGBTQ Catholics. It's a huge step forward historically. Um, he had said something like this, you know. You know, Pierce, it really never changes because mine was, mine's based out of the scripture. That's what I believe that the scripture says, that, that homosexuality is a sin. So, it, you know, I believed it before and I still believe it now. Again. Sometimes, like, People might try and say it's not, it, our love is the exact same and this means everything to us. Just to be married, you know, now we have this opportunity to be, this is my wife. <laughs> I can finally say she is my wife and we have actually... Hi, this is Vishwa. And this is Vivek. And we both got married in February 2017. As a pastor, handle that if there should be a point where a gay couple would come to you and ask you to marry them. Right now at this point, that's something that I wouldn't do, but that doesn't mean that they can't go outside of me and do that. And the Supreme Court was not legislating that churches would have to do it. They just made it possible that gay people who chose to do so could go to some other facility if they like. And there are some churches that will do it, but right now the Potter's House is not one of them. 
Okay, because there are a lot of pastors who have put this as some type of disclaimer in their bylaws right. to protect them for that, from Absolutely. that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's good. That's good. You know, religion religion doesn't agree. We don't agree about communion. We don't agree about what day to worship on. We don't agree about a whole lot of things. And that's why protecting religious freedom is important. That's what this country was founded on. But I think that we have to share freedoms with other people who have other views. Single issue. Categorically, they said, I cannot be a part of a church that accepts same-sex marriage. In our time, how do we as Christians deal with it? So, Joe, if you don't mind, I'd like to take an extended answer on this. You know, let me give you about three panels of an answer. The first panel is the logical problem. The second panel is what I call the theological problem. And the third panel is what I would call the relational problem, how you communicate. It means that people should be free to enter into any kind of relationship they want to enter into. It's really no one else's business in terms of uh, trying to regulate or, or prohibit behavior. All of us were on our way to hell. But Jesus came and changed our condition. And just like the Lord changed us, He can change somebody else. I do want to thank you for looking at that, that um, featured video. We hope that it has edified you. And um, as a result of that, um, you can have a, a very good perspective as it relates to um, the LGBT. LGBT um, QI movement, all right? It's, it's very important that we understand that God has a plan for every one of us. And that's very, very important because sometimes we think that there are, there are, there are individuals who are not um, important to God. Uh, God has seen them as outcast or no good. But God has a plan for every individual. And all of us have been infected with one disease, and that disease is sin. And it doesn't matter what form it comes in, what, what type, or what color, what shape. It doesn't matter to God. He's, there is only one solution. According to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name for Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. So I don't know what sin you are struggling with, uh, my panelists or myself, but what I, want to, what I want us all to understand is that Jesus is the solution to all of our sin problems, right? So we'll take some comments online and then we'll deal with some biblical passages as it relates to the um, LGBTQI movement and then we'll close the program for today. So we'll take some comments online. So if you have any little question or any comments, um, you, can ask, you can ask those questions, right? Or prophecy, I saw a question, that, um, a statement that says prophecy, all right? Um, Wise King said, prophecy must be fulfilled. See how these pastors are making excuses and adopting to the leader who recently announced to accept something that's wrong, all right? And read Romans 1. Now, they have but one reward for this wicked life, and those of you supporting are entitled to it as well, all right? So we come into the to scripture. We'll read um, part of Romans 1 as well. Wise King, thank you very much. Say, let us work with God in the reconciliation process of persons. God, uh, amen. All right, so somebody make reference to the singing, lovely singing. I say we should like them. We should let them know it's not normal and it's not right. All right, there's really saying that. Okay, Manasseh say all of us indeed, all of us are in need of Jesus, just like the homosexual. Without Jesus, we are nothing. As we say, there is no nice way of putting it. What's wrong is wrong and must be told. All right, um... Craig is asking Chad to look at it. Manasseh says, we are to grow in grace and in the fear of the Lord daily. As we say, we should let them know it's wrong and that the Bible does not support it. All right. Pastor God, you want to say something? I yes, see you're, you're I, eager to say something. I, you know, I, I have always thought of the fact that we can sometimes be victims of our own rightness or our, our own right positions. Um, while it is a fact that homosexuality is wrong, and we cannot compromise. We must be unequivocal on the wrongness of it because the Bible excoriates it. But at the same time, I have a problem with the approach that some people take. They keep, they're very caustic, very acidic, very, very uncompassionate. Now, I don't think that we should take that approach. I believe we must be clear 
but at the same time, we must understand we're dealing with human beings. And Mr. Moderator, I was called once to speak to a certain gentleman. I'll make it very brief. This is anecdotal evidence. The gentleman was serving time in prison. The prison authorities invited me to talk with him. And he, he, was, he was actually convicted for molesting boys. He was a practicing homosexual. And so I got him sitting across from me in that session. And as I explored his history, he told me that he got into this thing when he was 12 years old because he was molested in a certain context, which I shall not name, uh, um, in a particular area. And he said the particular person is um, molested him. And from the time he was molested as a boy, he had the inclination, and that's why he got into it. My heart was full of compassion. And Pastor Gittins, had I taken that caustic, acidic, condemnatory approach, he wouldn't have opened to me. I was able to lead him biblically, lead him to Christ. But my point is, there are some people who are really struggling. There are some people who were led our Lord into this thing. You cannot always be harsh and acidic. You've got to be compassionate as you reach out. All right. Okay. Um, as we say, that's why we pray first and let God lead and direct. All right. Let's go down with the comments. All right. It says, you have to enlighten the individual about biblical facts. You as pastors have the compassionate, loving, etc., but also true to the word of God. All right. True consequences. Um, so if someone is born, right, well, we, we say we will deal with that um, next week. Next week, please, God, we will deal with that. Okay, so we're going down to that comment there that Lynn Phillips said, that long comment there. Let me see what he said. He said, my problem with the Seventh-day Adventist church is that too many of the pastors teach and preach according to their own personal feelings instead of following the biblical words of God. This is why so many members go astray, backslide and commit sinful practices while attending church as stalwart members. The pastors whitewash, water down, and are too lenient to members' sinful practice. No sin is greater than the other. All sin is sin. The relationship, for, the relationship for salvation is with God, not being favorable to the pastor or member. Pastors need to call sin out for what it is, not for how many persons or members or attend or join the SDA church. All right. And Craig to reply in there. He said, how, how could have the problem with the church? Oh, probably asking how she have the problem with the church. All right. Generation cost is real. It have to be broken. Only prayers can solve that problem. Let's go down. My question is, somebody have a question. So we answer that question, and then we go to the biblical passage. My question is, what about the people who say they were born with this? How can one redirect one's feeling uh, to the way God intended? Well, we have that question book for next week. So we answer that next week, please, God. All right. Um, okay. All right. So we're moving on now to the scriptures. So let us go to the, to the scriptures and see what biblical passages or texts or reference exist which, which condemns the homosexual lifestyle? What are some of them? Well, Mr. Moderator, the, the Bible is clear, um, as we have been pointing out. And I, I, it's interesting that we are democratic. We allow folks to express their opinions, uh, technologically so. But some of the comments that I see, I just wonder about them. Um, the, the pastors are clear, and I can speak for all the Seventh-day Adventist pastors, especially in our conference. We are unequivocal. We speak with one voice as far as the issue is concerned, and our voice is a biblical one. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. The King James says abusers of themselves with mankind. If you read um, the NIV, it says homosexuals, which is more consistent with the Greek. Um, in verse 10, it says, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor junkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So here we have beautifully itemized a number of sins, including sexual sins. And notice that it says fornication, you know, um, and adulterers and homosexuals. So we are against every type of sinful, every type of misuse of the sexual powers. All right, before and you go on look past at verse 11. Before you go on to verse 11, pass. Even have something that you talk about the party lovers to revelers. Yes. You know, sometimes we only see homosexuals. You see, idolaters, effeminate, lovers of, of, of pleasures, all right? And all those different things. But 
I, I want, want to, oh, I remember before you go to verse 11, that before I accepted Christ, I, I, there was a guy who used to witness to me. And I went to the Bible and I read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. And I tried to see all the things that I was doing there and I tried to mark it out. And say, okay, well, God, you have to help me with this one and this one and this one and this one. But when I read verse 11, I realize that a lot of us who condemn homosexuals, right? Not the act, but the persons. You condemn them or we condemn them or we say they are hellbound, fire for them and all those different things. When we look at verse 9 and 10, we see ourselves there for who we were. But let me see what verse 11 says. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Pastor, one of the problems I have itemizing this list, nobody has a problem saying that junk cards are sinful mm -hmm. or revilers, revelers. Mm -hmm. The problem we're having today is that they don't want us to say homosexuality is sinful. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's the big thing? The big thing is that the, all these, these um, descriptions ought to be taken for what they are, sinful. And I'm sorry for those who say you, you must not say homosexuality is sinful. It is one of the, the items listed. But a beautiful thing that we find in verse 11, oh, yes. which, which actually, Mr. Moderator, runs contrary to the American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric Association, the APA, it's now against the law for you to do any form of corrective counseling. Um, it is now said that you could lose your license as a practicing counselor if you try to counsel somebody to give up homosexuality because they're saying you're inducing guilt and it's, it's contrary to who the person are, is inside. Well, I'm sorry. I have to disagree with the American Psychiatric Association and agree with verse 11 of St. Paul's writing. He says, and such were some of you, mm -hmm. but you are washed, you are sanctified, and you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus. So it means that conversion is possible. Every homosexual can be changed. The Spirit of God can bring that transformation. Amen, amen. All right. Persecutions, do you have any, any biblical text or reference that condemn homosexual lifestyle? Uh, I am reading from Romans chapter 1. Okay. In verse 26 it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, born in their lust, one toward another, men with men, walking that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, uh, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, there we have it very clearly spelled out uh, that the natural uh, male attracted to female is what was God's intention originally at creation. And here the, it, it itemizing, itemizes uh, women with women, change the natural use, men with men, change the natural use. And that practice, uh, the Bible here in Romans speaks clearly against it. Forget me, deal with what the Bible says. And I, I love verse, verse, verse 28 because verse 28 is actually saying that God does everything to reach out to the individuals. And after they refuse to accept God and they do not want to retain him in their memory, say that God gives them up to a reprobate mind. You can do what you want then. But uh, as, as we read the Bible, you realize that God gives man chances after chances. And that's what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 and verse 9, sorry, it says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God's desire for all of us is that all of us should come to repentance and bring our lives in harmony with him. Let me just take some comments online and then we'll take the closing comments from um, Pastor God and Pastor Gittens and then we'll close up for this evening. All right. Um, as we say, the end, the, this is the end time. Of course, through faith, you can cure anything. Chad Augustine says, everyone can be changed. And that's God's desire for us because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, therefore, if any man, any man, any person be in Christ, He's a new creature. All things are past. We behold, all things are become new. So it doesn't matter what you are struggling with today. God can, can change you and give you a new start. All right? 
um, um, Sister Alicia says, only if it is to the glory of God, not everything will be cured, all right? And my holy king says, yes, if God wants to, he'll cure it, right? And not only if God wants to, if the individual, because God doesn't force himself on individual, we have to be willing to do that. And that's what the Bible says in Romans, in um, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. In other words, God, God is a gentleman. So he doesn't force his way into our lives. We have to be willing, have the desire, and ask him to do that, and then he will change it. God doesn't just go around changing people if they're not willing to be changed. He speaks to them through his Holy Spirit, and then when they yield their lives to him, then he changes them to be men and women women of God. All right, Pastor. Go on. Uh, we were just reading some Bible quotations, um, Brother Moderator, mm -hmm. and um, um, they were very interesting. I have heard supporters of the LGBTQQIA say that you guys quote the scriptures, but you don't quote other pas um, passages that are, that are more in keeping with what we're saying. For example, doesn't the same Bible say you must love your neighbors and even love your enemies? Why then are you refusing to love us? And I, my response is, I love all homosexuals, all transgender people, queer, questioning, intersex, whatever category you fall in. If I have, for example, Mr. Moderator, a gay couple living next door, and if in the middle of the night one of them starts vomiting or having some serious health issues, they can knock on my door, I get out of my bed, and, and give them a ride to the hospital. If a gay couple is having issues with um, social justice in terms of getting their housing benefits or whatever, or they are being punished on the basis of their, their sexual orientation, so you are not allowing the man to get his housing benefits because you say he's a homosexual, no. I, I, I would be one person advocating on the basis of social justice and humanity. You must be humane towards them because they're people. So if the, if the homosexual's car breaks down in the middle of the night and I'm driving and I recognize that that is a transgender person or homosexual, I'm stopping my car, rolling up my sleeve, and going out there to help because that's what the love of Christ in my heart makes me do. Amen. But in showing all of that love, it does not mean that I condone what the persons do. Okay, thank you, Pastor Gittens. Closing remarks. Um, this, this program reminds me that some types of sexual sins uh, can be learnt by individuals. And it also reminds me that with the coming of social media, the internet, or various devices, the world is a global village. And on many occasions, there are youths and children growing up who will learn certain behavior including how to be a practicing homosexual from the internet. Uh, my take on this is that we as adults, parents, grandparents, pastors, guardians, etc., we need to be aware of what is peddled on the internet and biblically guide our youths, our children, etc., into what is correct behavior so that later in life uh, they uh, can end up being persons who know clearly based on the word of God what is right and what is wrong and to practice that which is right. All right. And thank you very much. And we know that with God all things are possible. All right. All things are possible. So I just want to thank you for being with us today. I want to encourage you to tune in next week at 11.30 a.m. On Tuesday, we will continue with our part two of this program. My partner, male or female, does it matter? The LGBT movement, LGBTQI movement and the church. My, my partner, male or female, does it matter? And remember that with God, all things are possible. And you remember to tell your friends, tell your family, um, share the link. Don't take all the benefit for yourself. And I realize there are some healthy comments that are, that are coming on. I, and we want to encourage you to, to tune in next week, please, God, as we continue to discuss such an interesting topic 
and a topic that is life changing. At this point, we'll ask Pastor Gittins to pray as we close. Let's pray. Our God and Father, thanks ever so much uh, for your goodness towards us. Thanks for your goodness and blessings uh, towards the viewing audience. Father, help that what we discussed today as panelists and moderator, help that persons will understand clearly uh, that our love for human beings uh, will cause us to always want to see uh, that persons end up, up in heaven. And so help individuals who have listened to this program to go back to the word of God and be guided uh, by the word of God as it relates uh, to the subject LGBTQIA movement. Lead out, I pray, O oh God. Uh, Father, you are merciful to us. Uh, yet at the same time, you allowed the story of Sodom and Gomorrah to be recorded in Genesis chapter 19, pointing out to us that if individuals stubbornly go against your word, they can end up in hell. Uh, help us today, God, also... Uh, especially adults, pastors, teachers, whoever, uh, to let children and youths who are growing up to be guided by your word and not only to depend upon the internet to know what is right and what is wrong, but let them know, let us guide them into knowing that your word, the Bible, will certainly uh, guide them into what is right and what is wrong and show, point out what is wrong. And may your Holy Spirit help, especially the younger generation, uh, to take guidance from your word and do that which is right. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen and amen. amen. All right, we want to thank you again for being with us. And there is a link there. There is a link for prayer. There is a link to make a decision. And there is a number that you can call. So just follow the link on the, on the page and the site right in the comment section. And we will reach out to you as you reach out to us. God bless you and enjoy the rest of the day.